How's it going everybody? My name is Aaron Hilliard. Welcome to Mushroom Wonderland. If you're new to this channel, we talk all about mushrooms. Smash that subscribe button, hit that thumbs up if you like content like this, and leave a positive comment. So on this video, I'm going to be doing a bit of an interview with a really famous mycologist. And if you're anybody who's kind of in the mushroom world, zeitgeist, you will recognize the name Alan Rockefeller. And I had an opportunity to go out with him for a day and go foraging. And uh, so I asked him random questions on camera, questions that you probably have asked and that a lot of new people ask about mushrooms. He's basically self-taught and he works for a therapeutics company in Amsterdam. And uh, he has learned how to sequence the DNA on these mushrooms um, to give them new names. He's really famous for his studies in the Psilocybe genus. So magic mushrooms, if you're into magic mushrooms at all, you've probably heard Alan Rockefeller's name. It was a really fun day and I really appreciate him letting, letting me ask him all these questions so that uh, we can get it out to you. So with no further ado, let's jump into this interview with Alan Rockefeller and see what we can learn about mushrooms from one of the world's top leading famous mycologists. Thanks for joining us here on Mushroom Wonderland. Welcome to Mushroom Wonderland. What got you into mushrooms? Uh, I got into mushrooms about 20 years ago. I went mushroom hunting on Christmas Day in California, and there was mushrooms everywhere. And I figured there must be people that knew which ones were common, rare, and edible, poisonous, hallucinogenic. But that was back before many people were on the internet, so it was difficult to get information at first, so I was just uh, editing Wikipedia a lot, taking a lot of pictures, and just kind of got more and more into them. I used to do uh, computer security, so I was breaking into computers for a living. And I used to work for corporations and governments and stuff like that, but about 10 years ago I quit all my office jobs and I've just been mushroom hunting full time for about 10 years now. So now I'm the chief mycologist for a company called Mimosa Therapeutics, and it's a small psychedelics company. And uh, I pretty much just go mushroom hunting all the time and uh, then also study mushrooms. So I bring a lot of stuff back into the lab, DNA sequencing, microscopy, get really good pictures of it. And then a lot of people send me mushrooms in the mail that, that I study. Um, so I've been, I've been doing that for about a year and I like it quite a bit. Where are you based? Oakland? Oakland, yeah. yeah cool. Science uh, can be done by citizens and especially with like mycology it's like uh, really useful because there's not too many people paid to study mushrooms, especially wild mushrooms. There's not much money in like taxonomy so the real scientists go where the real money is, like plant pathology which is super boring but a lot of people want to pay for it. Uh, but just uh, people can make real contributions to science by taking good pictures of uh, what they find out there and especially doing DNA sequencing and uploading the DNA sequences to GenBank. Um, but you know, really any kind of careful nature observation is, can be considered citizen science. I never went to college for anything. I just, uh, just, I always thought I would go to college, but I just started breaking into computers in high school and you know, got a job right out of high school breaking into computers and just started doing that. Yeah, I think anything you can learn in college, you can learn uh, on the internet these days if you have sufficient motivation. Not everybody does, so college is definitely the right place for some people, but for people that are really into stuff, um, you know, you can learn everything. You know, it just really depends on what you want to do. If you want to be like a researcher at a university, you definitely need a degree. But if you want to work for like a you know, small company or work for yourself, um, you know, nobody really cares if you have a degree or not. How many new species do you think you've discovered? Oh, it really depends on how you define discovered. Um, I think we've probably seen some new species today. I think on a good day we'll discover 50 new species, but there's, uh, you know, it's easy to find new species because there's so many that just haven't been published. It's a lot of work to actually write them up and do a good job of writing them up. So I think I've published maybe six or something like that. I don't really keep track, but as far as like discovering and saying like, oh, this is a new species, uh, probably about 200. And of those, probably like five or 10 of them I'm actually working on, maybe 20. So like when I see it, I'll take real good pictures of it, save the collections. So when I want to publish something on it, I got a bunch of different collections, a bunch of different DNA sequences and uh, you know, lots of microscopy from all the different collections. So I know what the true variation 
is between the different species. Cut or pluck? Uh, I think it's best to pluck them and then take those stem bases and then cut them off and plant them in new areas. That's going to be way better than anything else, but it doesn't really matter if you cut them or pluck them unless you're disturbing the mycelium a whole lot. What's the purpose of like doing microscopy work and DNA sequencing? Like what, what's the end game in that? Like well, there's a lot of mushrooms that look the same, but they're actually different. And that can be due to convergent evolution. Um, like two mushrooms that are not closely related at all, just happen to find that the same sort of uh, ecological factors are impacting them, so they end up looking the same. So a microscope is really good for figuring that stuff out because the things will look the same in person, but under the microscope, they're super different. Or different mushrooms could look very similar because they are closely related. So if you want to see how different they are, um, you know, DNA sequencing and microscopy is really useful. You can taste any mushroom. You Death got, cap. You to, yeah, you got to eat quite a bit. There's a, a guy that uh, wanted, people said it was dangerous to taste death caps, nibble and spit, and so he tried eating a piece of death cap the size of his thumbnail. Nothing happened, so he did it the next day. Nothing happened. He probably gave himself permanent liver damage, but he never noticed anything, so the amount that you actually ingest just from tasting it is not going to do anything. people can touch most mushrooms, but some people get allergic reaction from Omphalotus or Swillus, but that's pretty rare and you know those mushrooms that some people get reactions from, 99% of people can touch them no problem. So DNA sequencing is really good because you get you know, like a digital readout of how different it is, uh, but we've only been doing sequencing for about 20 years, so there's a lot of species that just haven't been sequenced yet. So to figure those out, you need to do the microscopy. So I find that the microscopy is a much better use of time once I have a DNA sequence. So I save everything I photograph and then uh, I sequence it all with the ITS gene. If ITS doesn't answer my question, then I'll sequence some more genes. And if I don't get any good, confident blast matches, I'm just, you know, once I blast my sequence, if I'm not positive what it is, then I'll use the microscopy. And what the microscopy allows me to do is to compare with the old literature. So people have been doing microscopy for a couple hundred years, so all the literature is based on microscopy. So, uh, you know, the DNA sequencing is, is very new, uh, but, you know, you can compare with all the old literature with the, the microscopic features. What do you think about the importance of uh, bringing common names to America like they do over in Europe? Uh, I think the scientific names are better because with, uh, with the common names you got so many different uh, mushrooms with the same common name and uh, you just can't really be very specific. So if you really want to be specific and talk about a certain mushroom and kind of learn about it and learn you know, all about its habitat and where it, where it occurs and what it really is, you pretty much always use scientific names. Plus common names are different in every language. Like if yeah. people are speaking Chinese, I have no idea what they're talking about, but then they'll be like Sudasuga Menzaisia. I'm like, oh cool, they're talking about Douglas fir. So it's good, it's good because <laughs> it's international. You know, in every language there's different common names. Like in California, we have 30 indigenous languages and they all have their own common names for all the mushrooms. Uh, yeah. And there's 170 indigenous languages spoken in Mexico. And there's you know, tons of common names there. And the common names kind of vary from town to town. So, um, so I always use scientific names just so I can be precise and people know what it what it is that I'm talking about. So Latin is the same no matter where you go in the world, huh? Well, they actually pronounce it differently. Um, scientific names are a mixture of Latin and Greek, but if you go to Mexico, they will say Silocibe in the United States, Silocibe in Italy, they'll speak it with whatever Italian pronunciation rules there are. Uh, really, the only pronunciation uh, rule with scientific names is that you speak quickly and with confidence and pronounce all the syllables. So okay. As long as you're not dropping syllables, people will know what you're talking about. Okay. There was a guy in my mushroom club, he seems to know quite a bit, he said that one thing about speaking scientific names or Latin is that they don't have silent vowels, so the E's are always hard, like psilocybe. For a long time, I thought it was psilocybe. 
And yeah, then, people uh, say a lot of stuff like that, but I've also heard that if you pronounce uh, Latin the way a Latin teacher would, with like classical Latin pronunciation, then no one will really understand you. Uh, so I don't worry about pronunciation as much as most people. I just say it, and some people think it's wrong, and other people think it's fine, but as long as they know what I'm talking about, I don't... don't and you're confident. Don't really care. Yeah. Like I said, Rusula for years and years, and yeah, then all these... All these people in the mycological community say Russula, and it sounds boring to me, well, but the I... the world expert in Russula says Russula, which is ridiculous, and I'll never say that, but it's probably <laughs> correct in some sense of the word. Do you say fungi or fungi? Both. Both, okay. This has been super interesting, so I hope you got some value out of this video, and hit subscribe, and uh, join a mycological society near you to learn more about these mushrooms. So, thanks. Peace. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, totally. So hopefully that answered some questions for you. Not every day you get a chance to ask these kind of newbie questions to a famous mycologist. So thanks for joining us here on Mushroom Wonderland and make sure to hit that notification bell so you can see when the next video comes out. There's constantly new content coming out. So if you've got a bizarre interest in mushrooms, you've found your home here at Mushroom Wonderland. So we'll see you all in the next episode. Thanks a lot and much love.